every November 20th in Mexico. The beginning of the Mexican Revolution is traditionally commemorated. A party that a few years ago still included various parades and many things. With the passage of time, the celebration has faded a little, if you can figure out. But, but the Mexican Revolution has many interesting aspects. What do you say? If you join me tonight, we are going to talk about the Mexican Revolution and one of its key characters. Tales from the Dark Side Ghost Strange beings Inexplicable events Human perversity Stories that other minds prefer to ignore You see, in Mexico in 1991-9105, at the beginning of the Ditex century, Porfirio Daz ruled an old general, a former combatant, a man who had even fought against Benito Juarez, a subject who at the time had fought against Benito Juarez's re-election. He comes to power and decides to stay there. Once you have power, there is no one to take it away. It is that simple. He becomes a dictator, and a very heavy-handed dictator. But to the outside world, Mexico was wonderful. I insist for the outside. Let me explain to you from a foreign perspective. Mexico was in a kind of economic miracle. There were railways. The Mexican railroad was growing enormously. There were many industries. Mexico was becoming the pinnacle of the international textile industry, with large textile factories. It was having an impressive boom. But in addition, it also had large ports. Ports like Veracruz, which had been conditioned and could receive steamers, the largest steamships there were. Also, of course, extensive work was being done on issues such as the telegraph, modernizing it, and mail services. Work had also begun on electricity generation in some places. And it's worth noting, and it should be noted that Mexico was also becoming a power in terms of oil production. Although it was international companies that were producing. Also, of course, mining. Mexico was a mining country. Unfortunately, all this outward boom, all this bonanza that was seen was precisely outward. Besides that, Mexico seemed to be at peace. Keep in mind that since 1810, this had not stopped being at war. After the independence war, there has been an incredible number of wars, including the Reform War, the French invasion, the war against the English, the North American invasion, the child heroes. Well, this was crazy. But when Porfirio Daz comes to power, he makes sure that this no longer happens. How is it managed? Well, that is another story. Because the point here is that this was a piece very similar to the piece that exists in the cemetery. Nothing moved. Nothing happened. Because if something happened or someone moved, they were quickly eliminated. There was also, of course, democracy. Of course, anyone would say, Mexico is a democratic country. Yes, I know that Porfirio Daz had been in power for many years, but from time to time were elections he always won them himself. Except for one that a compadre of his won and who later took his power away. But the fact is that Porfirio does organized elections. People went to vote and he won by absolute majorities. How oh, it reminds me of certain things we are seeing today in different countries around the world. But in Mexico, Don Porfirio made his elections. He nominated his opposition candidates who always lost and accepted defeat. When they accepted defeat, the United States immediately sent letters of congratulations and gifts. And Europe, of course, sent many congratulations. All European countries, things, well, anyone would think this was paradise. Except for two or three details. The first of which, 90% of the Mexican population was in poverty. 80% of the Mexicans 
did not know how to read or write. The vast majority of Mexicans survived precariously. They were productive lands, yes, large extensions in a single control. For example, in the north, in Chihuahua, there was a single hacienda that had 500,000 hectares. Yes, it seems incredible. Within this estate, it was owned by a single individual. He had various cities that were part of his property. Once this guy was in the middle of a conference, in a talk at the presidency of the Republic in the government palace, someone asked him, excuse me, are you from Chihuahua? And he responded, no, no, Chihuahua is mine, alluding to the amount of properties he had. The average Mexican would be many things. He could be a worker and work 80 hours a day, seven days a week. He could be a rancher and work equally 60 hours a day, every day of the He could be a miner and any other profession of this same nature. The result is that many of them worked these incredible hours in exchange for a very meager salary that they never saw because stripe stores were established in Mexico. That is to say, I am the owner of the mine. I am the owner of the fact. I am the owner of the ranch. The hacienda, the exploitation, therefore, I sell you the products that you need. Of course, I sell some of them to you up to 10 times their value. Multiply 10 times their value. If it's not enough for you, don't worry, I'll give you credit. This means that that laborer, that worker, that miner will literally property. From those ranches, from those mines, from those factories, the result is that debts were inherited. If a worker died, while in debt at the factory, his children would inherit the debt. And it was not so strange because there was no type of health protection. Public services, there was not this. Therefore, if someone became ill and could not work and there was no one to work for them, they would die. There was no other option. If his children could work and cover him while he was sick, perfect. But if not, they were thrown out. It was a terrible condition. This leads to this led to people having nothing to lose. An incredibly dangerous situation. If you see it, if you can figure out. At the level of a social outbreak, the Mexicans in 1905 had nothing to lose. Instead, of course, there were large, prosperous companies with incredible incomes. The Yucatan farms of Enacon. We exported Necun fiber for the manufacture of ropes that were used on large warships halfway around the world. This old gum, rubber, whatever. But the vast majority of Mexicans ate beans if it suited them. The result was that I have nothing to lose. I am nothing. I am dead in life. The Mexicans, there was a saying that said, you are a dead man who is looking for a place to fall. That represented to the degree of desperation here. Of course, there were social outbreaks for 1009-16. The explosion in the Canania mine resulted in the death of a lot of workers. Because when they went on strike, they blocked access to the mine. The owner of the mine, who was a foreigner, chose to complain and request help from the United States, which sent a detachment of rangers, soldiers from there. The fact is that the brawl broke out they killed several Mexican workers. The Mexican army arrives. But far from protecting the Mexican workers, it attacks the workers and that ends with carnage. With the idea of supporting the owner of the Canania mine, the event would be repeated a year later in a textile factory in Veracruz, in Roblanco, near Orizaba. A strike breaks out again at this site. The workers do not want to work. They can no longer continue with these conditions of hunger and exploitation. Practically slaves, they try to unionize, open something, invent something. At that time, there were no such terms, but they were trying to protect themselves to form a union. They were crushed. Later, in Oaxaca, there was also an uprising. In another part of Yucatan, there is an uprising of the Henequineros. There was already a lot of discontent and there were various Mexican intellectuals who believed that this could not continue like this. There was st still another election that, of course, Don Porfirio won. Subsequently, in the face of growing discomfort and tension, because Mexican intellectuals 
also oppose the government of Porfirio Das. The result was that he announced that in 1910 there would be elections. There was a very particular man in Mexico who was Francisco A. Madero, Francisco Indalesio Madero. This guy from the north of the Republic, the son of businessmen, a wealthy, very intelligent man, would run as a candidate for the presidency. He was also a guy who spoke very well, had an interesting charisma, and was a great guy. The fact is that he proposes himself as a candidate to compete against Don Porfirio. The result, a few days before the election, he is accused of some minor crime and imprisoned and cannot participate in the election. Sound familiar? Well, history repeats itself sometimes. The fact is that good friend Madero calls for an armed uprising for November 20. 1910 began the Mexican Revolution, the first social revolution of the 20th century. The first in the sense of a social revolution, that is, the people took up arms. Officially, the revolutionary movement would end in 1917 with the proclamation of the Constitution. The promulgation of the Constitution of 1917, the historical reality that many historians maintain, is that the Mexican Revolution began because there are those who claim that it started from before, Canania. but it did not end until the 30 years, well into the 30 years with the government of Cesaro Cudenas. That is to say, Mexico was at war for more than 20 years. And indeed it was. This movement cost the lives of many people. I give you a terrifying fact. 1,910 Mexico had 15.1 million inhabitants. 15 million, 100 and some thousand inhabitants. In 1,921, the next census was taken. Mexico had 14.3 million. That is, it had about 800,000 fewer people than 11 years ago. This meant that not only had the population not grown, but it had decreased. This leads some demographic scholars to consider that in Mexico must have been around 4 million deaths, at least. Many factors were added. War. Hunger. Keep in mind that when war breaks out, general production falls. Trains stop running with food and supplies because the rebels and the military take them, so there is no supply. The Spanish fever arrived in 1918. This was the one I attended. It is considered the eighth deadliest civil war in history. However, in this story I am telling you, incredibly interesting figures emerge. Francisco Madero himself, a man of ideals, a believing man, a man who practiced spiritualism and who received instructions through automatic writing and through mediums on how he had to act and what he had to do. The Mexican Revolution is considered the first spiritualist revolution in history, that is, in the realm of the paranormal. But we also had Emiliano Zebata, Greek guy, Venustiano Carranza, we had Felipe Engeles, and of course, Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa. And if you go to the United States and say Mexican Revolution, they will answer Pancho Villa. If you go to Europe and in some country ask the name of a Mexican national hero, they will answer Pancho Villa. If you travel to many other parts of the world and there is a reference to national heroes, they will mention Pancho Villa. He is the quintessential Mexican hero. Curiously, it wasn't the most outstanding, but oh well. He's a great character. And I'm going to tell you about him. Of course, if he's in Tales from the Dark Side, it's because there was something else behind his name. And it all begins in 1878. His real name was Pancho Villa. José Doroteo Arango Arambula was his name. His father was the illegitimate son of a wealthy businessman or someone over there named Jess Villa. His mother was a homely woman, a dedicated worker. There are five brothers. Well, dead. he just leaves. Pancho Villa sometimes said that his father was gone. Other times he said he had died. Sometimes, depending on how he was in the mood, he would tell the stories a little differently. But the fact is that being very young, Dorothy, 
Theo has to work. It becomes pawns. First, he is a laborer on a farm. He has to leave his house at the La Coyotada Ranch. Walk 15 kilometers to the Santa Isabel de Beros Hacienda and arrive at 5 in the morning. That is, he got up every day at 3 in the morning and started walking. He made messages, carried things, took care of animals, eat what they told him. He was the handy person on the farm when he was almost a child. As he grows and his brothers grow, they now become sharecroppers. That is, they work other people's lands. The land belonged to the Kokojito Hacienda, a very impressive hacienda where they receive a plot, a stretch of land that they must work and produce. Most of it is given to the farm, but they keep a certain amount of what they have produced. That was the idea of partnership. It was a little bit above being a laborer. The laborer was almost a slave, the sharecropper. He worked from dawn to dusk, but at least he worked within his lands. That was going well. He was very hard working. His brothers were very hard working. His sister, Mariana, a beautiful girl. Let me tell you that. Contrary to popular belief, Pancho Villa was not a person of original features. If you can figure out, no, he was more of a blonde. It is not that he had blonde hair, but very white. There are those who claim that his eyes were a little light. It is hard to tell, but it was fine looking. His family had very handsome features. This leads to people from the north are usually light skinned. The fact is that he had this beautiful sister and one afternoon when he arrives home, the landowner's son is trying to take his sister away. He is taking her away. The mother is crazy screaming to please don't take her. She begs him. But keep in mind that the landowner had the right to the prima not. That is, to abuse the girl he wanted as many times as he wanted. Just Doroteo Arango runs to the house of a relative of his who has a rife, returns and shoots the landowner's son. There are those who say he killed him. There are those who say that he only wounded him in the leg, but left him lame. The fact is that when Doroteo realizes this and sees that the landowner's son's guards are coming for him, he escapes. He manages to escape and flees to the mountains. He knows the mountains. He walks there. He travels there all the time. He knows the small paths, the routes. He knows that his destiny is cast. His family would lose their partnership. They would have to fee from there. They would start looking for him and finally capture him. Man's objective was not simply to kill him, but rather to teach him a lesson. Because from that moment on, they called him the lame one. And as a joke, people would call him that. So what he wants is to get revenge. Let it be seen. A few months had passed since then, when he was captured and taken to prison. With the idea that he would be hanged the next day, he was a kid, 16, 17 years old, and they were going to hang him on a tree so that everyone could see him. And no, no one messes with the boss's son. While in prison, the guards are guarding him and decide that they have to use him for something. And they put him to shelling corn and then grinding it in a metate. With a metatone, this is a type of very primitive meal where the corn is placed and with a stone it is ground to make four and make tortillas. Taking advantage of the fact that the kid is there, let them put him to work. The idea was to hang it in the afternoon of the next day. So what they hang it on, let it serve a purpose. The other guards go that way and leave one there who uses a cigarette and chattering when he realizes. Jos Dorotea Arango has the metate stone in his hand and with it hits him with such force that he knocks him out and knocks him out. Leaves unconscious, take the gun and escape. From there, the story changes completely. Just Oroteo escapes to the mountains, the Sierra Madre and all these regions where he wanders for a long time, lives in caves, feeds on what he can until he finds criminals. A bunch of criminals from a guy whose last name was Para. Para was a bandit. A thief. He dedicated himself to stealing cattle, robbing carts, and robbing towns. He arrived at a ranch and assaulted it, assaulted the landowners. He had an impressive group of men accustomed to experiencing bush assault. People who lived in the mountains, who knew the caves, who knew how to go from one cave to another, disappeared. 
They simply disappeared from the pursuers when the rural people went for them. They simply vanished. They were no longer there. They had hidden in a waterfall, in a cave, in a ravine. Jos Doroteo learns all this. And he is a criminal. Of course, he is a criminal. Assault. He is very good with weapons. As time goes by, he has some differences with this gang of criminals. He becomes independent and is captured. Unfortunately for him, he is captured. But the moment they capture him and ask his name, he changes his name. He is no longer just Dorateo Arango. Now it is called Pancho Villa. With this, he manages to prevent them from identifying him as the bandit wanted for all that and from hanging him. Where did Pancho Villa get it from? That is a good question. Are there those who claim that Pancho Villa was the leader of a gang of criminals that he was and that he died? Are there those who claim that Pancho Villa occurred to him at that moment and he simply said Pancho Villa? We must not forget that his grandfather was Jess Villa, the ugly old man who did not recognize his father. He was the illegitimate son of that guy, his father. There are those who claim that to vindicate himself, he took his grandfather's name. The fact is that when they capture him for stealing cattle, he says he is Pancho Villa. They lock him in prison, and shortly afterwards they send him to the army. It was common for minor criminals, especially if they were incredibly young and had no major interest in killing them, to be sent to the army. They became soldiers compulsorily, and Pancho Villa was a soldier. He was in the army, in the army of Don Porfirio Diaz, in the federal army. He did not like that very much. We must be realistic. And about a year, a few months before his first birthday, he escapes, deserts and runs away. There are those who claim that he became Pancho Villa after that. There are those who claim that Pancho Villa invented it so that he would not be hanged. The fact is that he escapes from there and begins a criminal career like few other times. No, he's not a good guy. I'm going to clarify something for you. Pancho Villa kills. He has no problem with that Pancho Villa assault. He has no problem with that. Very soon he is surrounded by a gang of criminals. A gang of criminals who have the communities of northern Mexico in, in check. He becomes famous because he is a bold guy who can confront on people much larger than him and win the game. He is a guy who seems to fear nothing, because suddenly he attacks a military convoy, a train with soldiers, and still manages to assault and steal weapons and ammunition. But I insist, it is not good. It is murder. If he finds something that gets in his way, he kills it. It is said that many times, upon reaching a town, if someone tried to defend themselves, he would gather all the men in the town and kill them. That easy or burned them, or he did horrors to them. But he was also a very smart guy. Do not lose sight of that. What Pancho Villa did on many occasions was win the affection of the people. He was charismatic. His men adored him. The bandits who accompanied him adored him because he was not petulant. He was not a boss, but a colleague. The partner who knows how to get things done. The one who knows how to get into the paths. The one who knows how to walk at night. And that makes them respect and appreciate him. But the people, this leads to the rural people, the farmers, the scrubbers, the people who were in total crisis, those who were dying of hunger, adored him because, because he went and robbed the store of the hacienda. And of what was stolen there, he went and distributed a little here, a little there. Sort of like a modern day Robin Hood, but it wasn't really Robin Hood. What I did was buy wills in such a way that when the pursuers arrived generally the rural guards or federal soldiers the townspeople gave contrary instructions one said go there and another said go there and someone else said no it did not happen here and someone else said nothing happened here because they knew that when he returned he would leave them something again don't imagine treasures but for a person who is dying of hunger having someone give you a piece of car or give you a sack of corn, or simply give you some hierarchies, was important. This generated a kind of halo around Pancho Villa, if you can figure out. The reality is that it was cruel. 
If someone got out of his guacon, he killed them. If one of his men got drunk, he also faced the death penalty because Pancho Villa did not drink. He assured that a good part of people's problems was alcohol, basically, and those at the top. So they didn't drink. When he arrived at a town, he would raid it, destroy the liquor store, destroy the pokeria, steal what he could, and leave. This created a reputation for being invincible. Pancho Villa always managed to come out alive. That is part of the black legend. It is said that Pancho Villa actually had a pact with the devil. And I will tell you about that a little later. When everything is going on because of the conflict with Porfirio does, the beginning of the revolution, a person convinces him to join the movement. Pancho Villa is not a political man. He does not know how to read. He does not know anything about history. He doesn't know anything about anything. He is a bandit and he is a murderer. The fact is that he has a lot of people around him. This band of criminals are not 20. They are not 30. They are more than 500. It is an orderly, agile contingent that moves easily, that disperses easily, that unites easily. He has understood a concept that would later be applied in war. The Lightning War. Pancho Villa attacked quickly, took what he wanted and left in such a way that there were no positions, there was nowhere, there was nowhere to look for it. That was his success, but they convince him. He gets to meet Francisco Indalecio Madero in person, the hero of the Mexican Revolution, and he likes him wonderfully. He likes it wonderfully because what Madero says is what he feels. Pancho Villa, deep down, believed that he was a victim of the form of government, of the power of a few against the others, of exploitation. I believe that. He was convinced of being part of these victimized people. And when Madero explains to him what he plans to do, how oh, he plans to do it, he marries the idea, plus he likes her very much. They understand each other very well. There is a beautiful photo where Pancho Villa is in a group of people with Madero. Is the impact that Francisco Indalecio Madero has on Pancho Villa such, who accepts and joins the movement. And he joins the movement and it starts to bear fruit immediately. He begins to gather people everywhere. And there are no longer 500. Now there are two 030 attacks, Ciudad Camargo, Santa Isabel, San Cristobal. He takes them without any problem. Then he conquers the Ciudad Juarez. Even though Madero did not want to take Juarez, he took Ciudad Juarez and moved on from there. He earns the name, you gain prestige, he becomes a legend. Madero recognizes him, even naming him Colonel. A Colonel who could not read or write. Well, there are those who claim that he could have read a little, but he was not very skilled at it. He never set foot in the school, never went to school. The fact is that his fame is growing, but his fame is also growing as an invincible but not as a military invincible, but as a person. The legend said that he could ride 100 days in a row, that he could spend 100 nights without sleep, 100 days without eating. Many of his companions in the crimes claimed that they had seen him get shot and that nothing happened to him. Legend or not, the fact is that he gains prestige when finally 1,091111 signs and Madero calls elections. He wins the elections because it was obvious. He was the preferred candidate. He was the beloved man. And then they begin to demobilize the troops. Pancho Villa is assigned to work in the Northern Division, which was part of the Federal Army. Madero's problem is that he began to govern with the Porfirista structure, the Porfirista Army the Porfirista generals, people who hated him. Pancho Villa himself was assigned to this division as a colonel and later promoted to brigadier, honorary brigadier general. The problem is that the head of this division was Victoriano Huerta. Victoriano Huerta was a general from Don Porfirio's time who had fought against Pancho Villa. And now they were in the same place. Of course, this was a nightmare. The thing is that one day Victoriano Huerta accuses Pancho Villa 
of insubordination and theft of some horses, and he condemns him to death. He condemns him to death to die on the wall, to be shot, and the process continues. But it is part of this strange mystique of Pancho Villa. He will see the morning when they are going to shoot him. Pancho Villa reaches the wall where they are going to shoot him. There is the group of soldiers who are going to shoot him. And he approaches one and is talking to him. And he's going to take his hat off. Pancho Villa wore different hats. But that day he was wearing a nice, fine hat. He's going to take it away and give it to the soldier. One of the soldiers who is going to kill him. Because it is not worth it to pierce your hat and ruin it. He's going to give it to her. He's talking to someone else. When he tells her that those shoes, she is wearing are very damaged, and she bends down to take off her Pancho Villa shoes and give them to him. The fact is that those soldiers are truly conflicted because the order is to shoot him. But while time is passing and they have a cigarette and are talking, an order comes not to kill him. Just when they were going to shoot him, strange. You are not going to believe me. The order came from Francisco Indalecio Madero. Officially, it is said that the intercession of Francisco Madero's brothers intervened so that he was not shot. Unofficially and according to legend, Madero, while in Mexico City, learned that Pancho Villa was going to be shot in an unnatural way. The spirits told him not to let him kill Pancho Villa. That is why the urgent telegram was sent from the National Palace. There is no way to prove it. They are legends. If you want, they are legends. The fact is that Pancho Villa is saved that day by a hair's breadth for having started giving away the shoes and hat to the soldiers who were going to kill him. The fact is, fine, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to send you to jail. They sent him to prison, to Tlatelolco, in Mexico City. There is a video of Tlatelolco there, if you like to see it. Being there is where he learns to read and write. In jail. And he knows a lot of people. And he meets other bandits. And he meets many more. But he was already a military man. Very strange, because it had been done in the countryside. The issue is that he escapes. One day he manages to escape. As, most likely the guards themselves. Most likely Madero. The president helps him. And he travels to the United States where he takes refuge. Being there is when an armed uprising of the army. A coup d'etat occurs. Victoriano Huerta, the arch enemy, the guy who had wanted to shoot him, takes up arms and kills Madero. In the famous tragic scene, he murders him. Poncho Villa is there, outside, far away, in the north, in the United States. When he found out about this, they say that he cried. He suffered for the death of his friend. And from that moment on, he starts planning how he goes back and takes control. How he goes back to war and would do it. The interesting thing about the case is that even though they tried to kill him all the time, they never could. In fact, while they were transferring him from northern Mexico to central Mexico, they tried to kill him at least five times along the way. The law accidentally escaped. They tried to throw him off an elevated bridge, of a cliff, and they couldn't. Even though he was tied up, they threw him and he fell on his side. A little later, I will tell you the reason for the legend, but the fact is that it survived. Shortly after, when Victoriano Huerta assassinates Madero, other leaders take up arms. Zapata, in the south, this strong man with a grim look, a dangerous appearance, but who deep down was an intellectual and a very brilliant man, rises, rises in the north Carranza, who was governor there, Pancho Villa enters. And it turns out that an army is immediately assembled. And this army is now called the Northern Division again. And the Northern Division adds 50 zero troops in a very short time. It is an enormously powerful group. The personal guard, Pancho Villa's close men, are known as Villas Dorados. They are excellent horse riders. They dress in khaki and have a golden emblem on their hat that recognizes them. The advance of Villas' troops devastates everything to the point where Victoriano Huerta is defeated. Expelled from the country, 
Carranza assumes the presidency and Villa is declared Brigadier General and head of the Northern Division. It's his moment of glory. While in these campaigns of advancing and defeating the adversary, Villa also gains extraordinary fame as the good man. It arrives at a place, opens schools, confiscates from here, delivers there, does not kill anyone who was not part of the war, rescues children and delivers them somewhere else. Things like that. He becomes a true Robin Hood. He is the hero. But he also had two or three secrets. You see. The first of them is that Pancho Villa suddenly appeared where he was not expected. In the middle of the battle, in the middle of his advancing horsemen, he went. And when they realized it, everyone was very surprised. Because even though they shot at them and continued shooting at Villa, they never hit him. He also had another trick. He attacked that night. Legend of Villa grows because at a time when there was no night war, Pancho Villa attacked the cities at night when they least expected it. First he attacked during the day and then at night when they thought they had retired to rest, he attacked again. He used to suddenly sit around a bonfire where his soldiers were eating. He would arrive and sit there and eat with them. What did this mean? First, the morale of the troops was incredibly high. Second, the respect for equality he gave his soldiers was enormous. Third, he knew what was happening, hearing what the soldiers were talking about, and he was protected. The same men with whom he had had a mug of coffee, with whom he had talked, laughed, told them an anecdote, told them a joke, would give their lives for him without hesitation. And so it happened. Of course. It was his best moment when they finally defeat Victoriano Huerta. They arrive at the National Palace, the capital of Mexico, and there is a very famous photo when Villa is sitting in the presidential chair. They were simply joking. He and Emiliano Zapata were joking. They were friends. They made a joke on Villa told him, No sir, General, you sit down first, my friend. And the other answers, No sir, because whoever sits there becomes bad. You better sit down. And Pancho Villa is the one who sits in the chair to take the photo. He was never president of Mexico. He simply took the photo as a joke. When all this is happening, Vonis Giano Carranza takes power. He becomes president of Mexico. Pancho Villa retires to the north uh, to manage the northern division. He is governor for a while there and all this. After that, Pancho Villa begins to be dangerous for the Carranza government. Carranza wants to establish alliances in the same way as before. He has not kept his promises. He has not fulfilled what he had said. He has not fulfilled the agrarian distribution. He has not fulfilled equality. He has not fulfilled this. To the point where Pancho Villa finally begins to hatch up. Plan to remove him from power. Put someone who does comply. This is known and obviously the war begins again. This war would come to a critical point in 1915 when Pancho Villa attacks the Bajo area, defended by Ivaro Obreg. The battles are terrible because Pancho Villa continues to think in the old way. Attack with cavalry charges. Levaro Obreg, who is aware of how the war is going in Europe, builds trenches where he places machine guns, pieces artillery and is prepared to finish off Pancho Villa. The ally, his friend, his brother, his battle companion and his strategist Felipe Enelias was not there that day. At that moment, he was not there to advise him and Pancho Villa attacks. The fact is that the northern division ends up reduced to a handful of men. Pancho Villa loses all his soldiers. They are massacred. Cavalry charges were no longer used. And he didn't understand the change. Despite being an avant-garde man, he did not understand. They massacred their soldiers there, in the area of Celaya, Irapuato, in the Mexican Bajo. With a handful of men, he escapes to the north, where he once again becomes a bandit. And this time it is much crueler, much more violent Pancho Villa is currently murdering people, simply because they are there. He burns towns, where there was some type of support for the Carancista government, destroying them all, respect some, not others. The Pancho Villa 
that was known as criminal. The bandit, the assailant, is still there from cave to cave. He does not sleep in a house in the same night. Sometimes he goes into a house to sleep, but in the morning he is somewhere else. Of course, the entire federal army is chasing him. Corranza from the capital, the president has ordered the capture. The governors are giving rewards for whoever captures Pancho Villa. The criminal Pancho Villa was the brigadier general. And now, you are criminal. And then, an incredible historical event occurs. It's 1916, and Pancho Villa attacks the United States. You sir. The only time that territory of the United States of America has been attacked on its territory. Pancho Villa crosses the border, attacks Columbus, New Mexico. It is the 9th of March of 1916, and accompanied by about 300, 300, the men, he attacks Columbus and destroys it. He literally demolishes it, burns things, destroys. There was a car agency. He destroys the car agency. He kills. He murders. He causes damage without knowing that just a couple of kilometers ahead, there was a complete regiment of cavalry that, upon hearing the gunshots and seeing the fire in the distance, starts behind Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa escapes with eight men. All the rest of his men die. Coincidentally, those eight survivors claim that Pancho Villa was wounded several times. What is more, in the United States, the news broke that Pancho Villa had died, that they had killed him, because the soldiers saw him being shot, arriving in Mexico. There was a rumor that he had also died from a leg wound. The bone had burst from the bullet, it had become gangrenous, and he had died. But it was not like that. He went back into the mountains, hidden there. The United States sent General Pershing, who by the way knew Pancho Villa well, they were friends. They had spoken for a long time. They had had business, they had exchanged weapons. What is more, Pershing sent gifts to Pancho Villa, that they sent him to chase him with 10,000 men. And that becomes a hunt that lasts more than a year during this period of time. Pershing literally combed every bush and could not capture him. Pancho Villa had something that did not allow him to be captured, that did not allow him to be found. And it wasn't just the people, because at this point people literally saw signs of pesos on Pancho Villa's head. There were rewards everywhere. The United States gave ten zero dollars for Pancho Villa's head. So, north of Mexico was full of bounty hunters, federal soldiers, rural soldiers, North American soldiers chasing a Pancho Villa that they could not find. When the constitution is finally promulgated in 1917, there is a certain stability, but we must put an end to Pancho Villa because this guy can take up arms again. It should be noted that there had already been assassinations against the other leaders of the revolution. They were all already dead. Only Pancho Villa remained. And there was no way to find him. He had two or three peculiarities. The first is that he had a happy eye. He loved having girlfriends and wives, lots of them and lots of children. He used to visit them, but they didn't even find him. Suddenly, one fine day, his enemy, his hated enemy, is dead. It is in March of 1920 when Carranza is murdered and the new government offers amnesty to Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa accepts the deal and begins a new stage in his life. In exchange for that, he will lay down his arms. The government gives him the Colonel Tillo Hacienda in Durango. Gives him 50 men for his personal custody at the government's expense. Recognizes him the rank of general but in retirement. And Pancho Villa retires. It is a moment of great tranquility in your life. Stop being the persecuted one. You no longer must hide. He is on his farm. There are 50 armed men who guard it all day. It is the time in which you can take a dip in a pool. There is a photo where she is in a spectacular swimsuit diving. There is another photo in which he is with a motorcycle. It has once again had good relations with the United States because it buys machinery. Conutillo's hacienda was literally a waste when he arrives and begins to organize the people. Open a school. All children have to go to school. Who never studied in a school, did not know what a school was. Opens a school for children. Sets up a medical dispensary. Brings the priest to say masses. He said that the village priests were good. 
that they not only took care of the souls of the people, but also took care of their health. And it was true. The fact is that Kanotiyo becomes a prosperous place and he begins to have a period of great tranquility. It is the time when you can afford or to carry many of your children. Because yes, when a woman came and said, General, do you remember you and I some time ago? Well, look, here's the kid. He said, no problem. You get it. I will take care of him. He was godfather to everyone. But he was still Pancho Vila, and it was still extremely dangerous. So dangerous that on one occasion, back in 1923, it occurred to him to say that as a general, if he wished, he could gather 40 zero men in 40 minutes. But he had already retired. At the same time, rumors spread that he had weapons hidden throughout the mountains. True powder kegs hidden in all the mountains in the caves. And he was ready to return to combat. General Álvaro Obregón, who had defeated him in Celaya, knew that he was taking very big risks. If Pancho Villa decided to re-enter the game of war, there would be no one who wouldn't stop. Maybe that's why on July 20% of 1923, they waited for him and they wasted a long time for him he went to see one of his wives in Hidalgo de Parral in Chihuahua he had several leaving there he was in his stroller he did not have his escort he only had four workers with him a couple of men in the running boards with rifles his secretary and he was driving coincidentally that day there were no soldiers that day there were no police the street was completely empty except for about 20 men who from the rooftops waited for him to approach. There was only one old man on the street. They had given the old man money so that when he saw the car coming, he would shout, Long live Pancho Villa. If he shouted just once, Villa was ahead. If he shouted twice, he was behind. That disgusting old man shouted, Long live Pan Pancho Villa. Just one time. Immediately afterwards, Shots were heard, 150 shots. There was no way for them to respond to the attack. One of the guards, one of his men, one of his golds, who came with him, managed to kill one of the attackers, but Pancho Villa was shot 30 times. One of the attackers came down and shot him in the head. It was the end of Pancho Villa, who was dead from there. The legend continued his own path. Pancho Villa was buried in Parral in Hidalgo del Parral, and his remains were later transferred to the monument to the revolution in Mexico City. Until then, history is history, with a bit of legend, but history. The problem is everything else. We are in stories from the dark side, and we still have a lot left. Pancho Villa was reputed to have made a pact with the devil. Yes, in the mountains, in the north, very young being there according to what he said there was a region where people went in durango to make pacts with the devil in a cave right where pancho villa hid it is said that in exchange for his soul he would be invulnerable invulnerable to bullets that's what the legend says hence Many of his men really believed that this was true and believed it at face value because they had seen him in shootouts where everyone around him fell except him. In battles in which cavalry charged, he went to the front, he was going in front. He was not hiding behind there or watching with binoculars from some hill far away. No, no. He had a gun in his hand firing shots and nothing happened to him. Don't you believe me? In the taking of Zacatecas, his horse was killed three times. Again, I insist what the legend says. We killed his horse three times. But he got up, shook himself. They brought him another horse and he continued firing shots. And then how did they kill him? That is another part of the legend. The other part of the legend says that knowing that Pancho Villa had a back with the devil, bullets crossed him. How is that? First, the bullet is crossed. A cross is put on the tip. Second, you bless yourself. And in the purest style of a legend of werewolves who kill each other with silver bullets. The last bullet that hit Pancho Villa in the head 
was a bullet specially prepared for him. For him. That is why that man who was hiding in a door approached and shot him in the head. The others were killed by the shots from above, but not Pancho Villa. But despite this, the fear continued. In 1926, the person in charge of the cemetery where Pancho Villa's body was found ran to ask for help because Pancho Villa's grave was open. The body was outside and the box was destroyed. Three years had passed and they had stolen his head. The head of Pancho Villa. They had cut it down and taken it away. Officially, it is not known who ordered it cut. There are theories ranging from skulls and bones, the secret society in the United States, because they considered Villa's head to be an object of power. There are those who claim that one of the governors ordered him to cut off his head and had it in his house. There are those who claim that it was stolen by bounty hunters to sell in the United States. And there are those who claim that they were so afraid of him that they were not sure he was dead. And for that reason, they ordered his head to be cut off. The corpse was already old. It was three years old. But obviously, paying attention to the ancient legends, whoever has the pact, the only way to defeat him is by cutting off his head. There is. But the story does not end there. The story of Pancho Villa continues because, according to legend, when he realized that his head and a finger had been cut off, his wife, the one who accompanied him at the last moment, ordered that the remains be moved several tombs further to a grave with another name, and that other remains were buried in this place. What other remains? It turns out that a young woman had died in the local hospital. A woman who was on her way to the United States had died, and no one claimed her body. So, they ordered that woman's body to be placed in Pancho Villa's tomb and covered. The point is that it was the body of a woman. But the legend continues because in the year 70, 1970 or so, when Pancho Villa's remains were transferred to the monument to the revolution in Mexico City, there are those who claim that when opening the crypt, when opening the box, what they found there was a body dressed in a dress, or at least with the remains of a lace garment and tortoiseshell buttons, and some very flirtatious thing, and a rosary in her hand. Pancho Villa would never have done that. The issue is that there is also other testimony that assures that when the remains were taken to Mexico City to be catalogued before being placed in the tomb, in the monument to the revolution, whoever reviewed it said, hey, this is not it is possible. This pelvis is from a young woman, not from a gentleman like Pancho Villa, but obviously no one said anything. And they were placed. From there, of course, there is also the legend of the headless horseman. Throughout the northern part of the Republic, Chihuahua, Durango. In these places where Pancho Villa spent his entire life as a bandit. For years it has been said that with some frequency on moonlit nights you can see a headless horseman coming and going. Even on the Canutillo Hacienda, for years it has been said that Pancho Villa can be heard walking, laughing, and his ghost whistling inside the Hacienda itself. So yes, he was a great character. If you go to the United States and say, do know Pancho Villa is a national hero, but he was also a bandit, a murderer, a guy who had no problem killing the father of a family. But before killing him, he made him watch how he killed his children and then hung them all on a tree. They were his adversaries. There was some political issue there and he killed all th three of them. But first he killed the children so that the father could see how he killed them. So yes, he was very tough. But he was a character who made his way into the story. He was a guy who could ride for days in the middle of very difficult territories. Who could face death without any fear. Strange. A strange character. You or I would think twice about even going for a walk in the middle of the desert. And these people lived there character from the story. And Will, after talking about this peculiar character, 
so worthy of being remembered, but at the same time so strange, so contradictory, now allow me to send some greetings. First of all, we are going to congratulate Graciela Quispe Salgado on her birthday. Congratulations and a big hug, Graciela, for Alejandro Osorio Pacheco, who is in Cotaro, also for her birthday. A big congratulations, Medri Antares and his girlfriend Miriam Camacho. A hug. Thanks for joining us. They are always present with us. They are always there. It's a pleasure to see you. We really appreciate you joining us. Alicia Echeverro wants to congratulate her son, Abraham Jimes. We send you both a big hug and a big congratulations. It's good that you join us. It's good that dad, mom, mom and children, that brothers get together to accompany us. We are very surprised by that. And well, we want to thank Yanira Salinas, Jorge Borrego Cardoza, Gloria Mendoza and Bilevalda Alonso for their support of the channel, their donations through. Super thanks. The videos that are already there. We appreciate it very much. We appreciate that help and the greeting section. Miguel de Serena, Gutierrez and his wife Concepcion Mendoza, who are in Isla Huaca in the state of Mexico. A very cordial greeting. Magdalena Marino and Eduardo Urbano, they listen to us together, so they are going there. Greetings, the guys from Subway Aeropuerto, who listen to us while they work. Won't their clan tail be scared away? I hope not. It gives us great pleasure to know that you accompany us while you work. Nico Ross and her husband Orlando, who are in Tucum, Argentina. Angie G always accompanies us. The Colts Almazan family, who are in Colula, in Puebla, here very close to us. Zaidubis Blanco, 38, that also always accompanies us. Thank you so much, Josefina and Ram Alvarado, who are in San Diego, California. It's a pleasure to greet you there. For Chris Ruiz, who is in Argentina. There are many people who join us from Argentina. And that excites us because Argentina has a tradition of impressive mystery programs and tremendous and very, very valuable investigators. Paquita, who is in Barcelona, in Spain, and accompanies us from there. Eduardo Madriaga is in Chile, completely on the other side of Milagos Bedoya. She is in Peru, the land of the Incas. Luis Flores is in Ecuador. He is at the waist of the world. Look, Daniel Gonzalez and Yuri Tatiana, who are in Bogor, Colombia. Roberto Massimo Silo, who is in Tenerife, in Spanish territory, but on the islands of Africa. It's impressive to see that they accompany us from so many different places, don't you think? And well, we're still here, Irene Romres, who is in Miawatun, Oaxaca, land of many traditions, beautiful places. Elsa Salinas is in Chihuahua. Chihuahua, the land where much of what we have talked about today occurred, the land of the northern centaur. Yes, Pancho Villa was called the centaur of the north, precisely because of that strange ability to ride for days. Isabel Carrasco, who is in Spain, Estela, and David, who are listening to us from Uruguay. Thank you very much to all of you. Good night, and may you rest in peace.